This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead. And that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. Oh, that I would have circumcised your hearts instead of your flesh. At that moment, Almighty God was wishing he was on the other side of the cross too. Because it's the heart circumcision that matters. 1 Corinthians 7, 19, Paul's dealing with this again and with those in, in Corinth. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. He wrote that to the Gentiles. How many know the Apostle Paul was a Torah teacher? That's where he had his double PhD. But he taught them through the lens of Messiah and what Messiah had done. The way to functional faith is to become a covenant conscious and to walk in the commandments of God as empowered by the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you something, that is also the only thing that is going to prick a Jew to jealousy. They've abandoned the Torah, they've replaced it with Talmud and with Kabbalah and everything else. What will prick them to jealousy is when they see these Gentiles walking in things they cannot walk in and doing it by the power of God. If you ever get the anointing around a Jewish person, they, it's, it's in their DNA, they know it's God. I had a friend when I was in the military, and he was, he was Jewish, and, and him and I argued, argued, argued theology. We went from Genesis to Revelation and back, and, and his family was very wealthy, and he knew that if he accepted Jesus, that they would have a funeral for him. He would be written out of the will. He would, he would have lost millions of dollars, kind of like, uh, oh, I just forgot his name. Zev Parat. When he accepted Jesus, he walked away from millions, millions, I think to the tune of 25 if I'm remembering right. His family basically over there runs the Sanhedrin, okay? He was trained, he went through rabbinical school, he was trained to be the next generation. And when the glory of God manifests over your bed and says, Yeshua is Messiah, you kind of have that road to Damascus experience, if you know what I'm talking about. I argued with him until I was blue in the face, and so we just had a worship service. There was just going to be worship, fellowship, and I invited him. I said, don't worry, there's not going to be any preaching. Nobody's going to pray for anybody. It's just going to, we're going to have great music. And he came and sat there, and about 10 minutes into the service, I began to see the tears flow down. And he said, this Jewish heart knows this is God. He, could, he had no argument with the anointing. And I told him, I said, the only way to get to that anointing is through Jesus. Come on. Let's go back to John, 1 John, chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. 
You see, one of the, I think one of the problems that John was dealing with, he had a lot of Gnostics coming into the fellowships. In fact, history teaches that uh, John, after a long journey, had come to a well, and there was a well-known Gnostic drinking out of that well, even though he was almost dehydrated. John refused to drink out of that well the same time that Gnostic was there in fear that people would see them both drinking out of the same well together and that Gnostic could use it by saying, see, I have in fellowship with the Apostle John. He wanted to give, not even visually, anything that could be construed with evil or wrong. And so they had Gnostics coming in, and, and they're saying, well, you know, Peter says this, and Paul says this, but, you know, I was transported into the Spirit, and I was there at the crucifixion, and, and I saw into the heavens. Why not? All this crazy stuff was going on, and giving another gospel. And John hated it. In fact, Polycarp said when he would hear these people and what they would say, he would literally shake himself and shake the dust off his feet and stomp his feet. Wanting nothing to do with it. And so they're coming and he says, now here's how you can tell the difference, guys. By this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Gnostics weren't keeping the commandments of God. It was an amalgamation of, of mystery religion with a little Christianese put in here and there. Later on it was kind of transformed into Kabbalah. But when you, when you look at the Nag Hammadi, I mean, it was they, they, that's where the, this whole erroneous teaching that in the years from Jesus when he, when he had his bar mitzvah until he was 30 and began being launched in ministry, he was supposed to have been in Egypt studying the Nag Hammadi. That he was, he was basically a sorcerer using mystery religion stuff for all this stuff. How many know that stuff is of the devil? He didn't do it. He was a carpenter, that was his family business, and he was taking care of his mama after Joseph died. None of that's true. Yes, he went down to Egypt for a little bit, but he came back because he was already back before he was 13 when they lost him in the temple. And then they come back and say, what are you doing? What, don't you know I'm going to be about my father's business? It was just to get him out of the reach of Herod because God knew what was coming. In fact, if you research a little bit, what the wise men brought him most likely was the inheritance of Daniel. Since Daniel was a eunuch, he had no inheritance, so he gathered his wealth. It was saved among the magi that he trained. And they said when they saw the sign, they were supposed to take his wealth to give it to Messiah. Interesting side note. How many know there's absolute perfection in the way that God moves? There's symmetry in the things that God moves. By this we know, we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, and so word and commandments are synonymous. Okay? He who keeps his word, truly the love of God is matured in him. Perfected in the King James, New King James, it's a, a derivation of teleos in the Greek, which means to be brought to maturity. Why is that important? Because mature love casts out all fear. And we're going to enter into a time, if the Lord tarries, that men's hearts will fail them for fear for what's coming on the earth, but it won't, it won't bring fear to the remnant because we have matured in love. And so an aspect of maturing in love is learning how to walk in the ways of God the way that Jesus did. Now, I, I have some in the Hebrew Roots movement that say, okay, now how do we keep the commandments of God? Easy. Turn to the book of Matthew. Turn to the Gospels. Jesus is, is the only true example of walking in the commandments of God. He walked them all. He did not violate one of them. Otherwise, it would have disqualified him as a perfect lamb. But since he's the one who gave them, you know, I, I, I see the reason why his ministry was three and a half years. The original Torah cycle as given by Moses was three and a half years. 
Jesus lived the original Torah cycle in front of the people of God saying, this is how you live it. And it isn't interesting that the Pharisees, the scribes, and the Sadducees all had problems with him because he was keeping it the way he meant when he told it to Moses rather than the way they had made it out to be. They had already begun replacing Moses with their own traditions. And he called them on the carpet over it. He said, you're making the Word of God a none effect by your traditions. You don't believe in me because you've already rejected Moses. We get to heaven in the book of Revelation, we find out Moses and Jesus are a duet. And even there they're stressing, because, you know, it's hard to contrast anything to Messiah, okay? The Song of the Lamb. I mean, when you said that, you've already said it all. But they remind us, Moses, stop, comma, the faithful servant of God. He was faithful in becoming that template that we'd recognize Messiah out of. It says, but he, he's perfected, and by this we know that we know him. We jump back over down to verse 24, or 22 through 24. And this is why, how many know your spirit man? I'm going to go here in Jeremiah in a minute. Your spirit man knows the Word of God even though you don't. Your brain doesn't, but your spirit man does. One of the problems that takes all the air out of our faith and all the air out of our prayers is when I try to stand in my authority and my spirit man knows that I'm in sin. It will knock the air out of your tires and you just kind of feel like, it's like there's, a, there's like a, a bronze heaven that I can't get through. Well, that bronze heaven isn't any higher than about right here. <laughs> if I'm constantly fellowshipping, this is one of the things John dealt with in, the fir- in his first chapter. If I'm in fellowship with him, daily walking with him, Jesus gets on my case where he needs to get on my case. He pats me on the head where I need to have be patted on the head. But because I'm in this dynamic relationship with him, his blood continually cleanses me of all sin. When I mess up, I run to him because he thinks it's a righteous thing to forgive me when I mess up as I'm learning. That's all in John chap- 1 John chapter 1. So if you're not in this dynamic tension relationship with Jesus, you're not, even, you're not even his. Now, if you are his, but you've let that relationship slip because the only thing that can cloud over a relationship with God is sin. He becomes further away. When he does, you try to pray, nothing works. Listen to hear what, what John says. And whatsoever... We, we ask, we receive of him, underline this in your Bible, because. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. You want to add some umph to prayer? Be kingdom conscious. Become covenant conscious. When his word says, you shouldn't do this, and my flesh says, I really, 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 really want to do this, I do the word instead. It's showing my faith in him is greater than my desire of the flesh. I'm supposed to crucify the flesh with the desires thereof. Why? Because I love him more. Yeah, this thing over here might be exciting, for a moment, right before it kills you. <laughs> but what the exciting thing is to know him and the power of his resurrection. <coughs> Let's go on. Now, he, now he, he's, because I, I can see the Gnostics reading this, and John kind of knows this, so he repeats this. And this is the command, that we should believe on the name of the Son of God, on his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another. You know what I need to share with them? Did you know that you have got to obey a commandment to get saved? If you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and His completed work at the cross and His death, burial, and resurrection, you're not saved. 
There is no record anywhere where there's an angel in heaven saying, yes, our databases are all connected to the First Baptist Church and the First Methodist Church, and we even got special database connections to all the independent churches that are out there. So the moment that they accept you on the roll, we recognize it in heaven. It's not there. Do not confuse church membership with salvation. You can take a sinner and you can hold them down until they're wrinkled and purple and look like a California raisin and they're still not saved. Baptism is a public testimony of believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a believer's baptism. Otherwise, as you might as well just call it going swimming the hard way. We've got to believe on him. Now listen here. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him. Uh-oh. How do I abide in Christ? I abide in the word and I do what the word says. You know, there's only a few things about the Torah of God that are changed because of what Jesus did. A few. Number one, Gentiles were, this whole thing of being under the law was something the Shammai Pharisees created a false doctrine that taught them you're not saved through faith in Messiah, you're saved through circumcision. That's the works of the law. In fact, there's archaeological evidence in the Dead Sea Scrolls that they actually pulled out a book penned by the Shammai Pharisees, and guess what it was called? The works of the law. So it's very possible that when Paul was referring to that in Galatians, he was referring to their book and not the books of Moses. Circumcision, that's why, that's why Paul says circumcision is nothing, uncircumcision is nothing, but by the transformation on the inside, you're keeping the commandments of God. So when I abide in him and him in me, I like what a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Carl Koch, got to meet Ariel Sharon when he was still alive. And they were wanting to do something over in Israel. And, and Carl kept talking to him about the commandments. And, and, and Ariel looked at him and said, why are you so, you're a Christian, why are you so excited about the commandments? And he said, I can't help it, a Jew moved on the inside of me. Jesus moved on the inside of me and he kept the commandments. And if I'm going to walk like him, I, have the, I want to learn how the kingdom operates. And uh, needless to say, Ariel was uh, intrigued. <laughs> but it's proof. And so a part of this abiding in Christ is abiding in his word. And the word of God does not start in the book of Matthew. The word of God starts in Genesis. A.W. Tozer said it takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian. And I think one of the reasons why we have anemic Christians today is we have separated them from two-thirds of the Word of God, told them that it had nothing to do with anything. When you look at the New Testament church, and I want to, oh, let's see, I'm not going to be able to get to it in seven minutes. Oh, big can of worms. Um, but by this we know that he abides in us. I'm abiding in him. He's abiding in us. Where's the proof in the pudding? I walk in the ways of God. I don't, walk, I don't walk like an Egyptian anymore. I don't walk like a Babylonian anymore. I'm walking like Jesus. In fact, I had someone on the internet get after me and say, how can you call yourself a Christian? I refuse to call myself a Christian because look what this person did with it and this person did with it. And Constantine said, blah, 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 blah. And I'm saying, go back to the principle of first mention. In Antioch, the pagans called them Christians to make fun of them because they were trying to be like little Jesuses. So I don't give two hoots what Constantine said, this is a definition of a Christian. I don't care what first church down the road says about being a Christian. I'm not going to let them hijack the name that we have had since Antioch. They had better start calling themselves something else because this is what it means to be a Christian. If you're not, quit calling yourself it because you're not one. Oh, I got my dander up just a little bit. The guys we receive of him, when I'm doing the word, when I'm, when I'm disciplining myself to the word of God, 
All of life is binary. That's when you understand the purpose of the commandments. And the Apostle Paul, and I don't have this in my notes, but when you read the book of Romans, he talks about another law. He says, now I studied the law my whole life. I couldn't do it because I found there was an, that when I got to the age of accountability, because it's very, it's a Hebrew concept from time of birth to your bar mitzvah, it's the day of learning. You're not accountable for your sins. But once you can prove to the community that you understand as an adult the ways of God, and then you choose to violate them, now this is the age of accountability. And he said, at the, he said there was a time in my life that I was learning the law, I was learning the ways of God, but if I messed up, no big deal, because I was learning. But that day that I sat there and I was declared to be a man, and my father fell on his knees and said, Lord, I thank you that now he is responsible for his own sins. That happens as a part of bar mitzvah. He said, when I sinned, sin revived and I died. And he said, I discovered there was another law, the law of sin and death. And the law of sin and death we have confused as thinking it was an aspect of Torah. It is not. Hell has its own Torah. And it's universal. And I don't care if you're a New Ager or if you're a full-blown Satanist, that that Torah of the devil is interwoven because he will try to mirror anything of the kingdom of God. And it's literally the opposite. If God says don't, he says do. And he said, this other law was working in me, but you know what? Jesus delivered me out of it because now in Christ Jesus, I become a new creature. And I'm no longer subject to this demonic law, but I've been made alive to the ways of God that keeps the devil out. When we begin looking at that, it, it's not about being Jewish. Especially when you look at modern Judaism, modern Ju Judaism is not biblical Judaism. They're as often, if not more, than we are. Gamaliel, would, if he looked at modern Judaism today, he'd go, Ive, hey, <laughs> what happened? Biblical Judaism is what we were grafted into. In fact, Brit Hadashah, Dr. Uh, Walter Kaiser, very renowned uh, theologian, was dealing with the concept of Brit Hadashah. And we translate it new like something completely new. He said, that's actually inaccurate. When you look at the etymology of that word, it means to be a renewed and expanded covenant. Which, was, which also goes in line, whenever a king would expand his territory, he would renew and expand his covenant. So Brit Hadashah means the expanded covenant so that we could get in. It's the circumcision of the heart, not of the flesh. How many are glad that we don't have to have, to have lambs we bring here to, to do on Passover and all these things? Because Jesus is now our high priest. We're now the temple of God. And let me tell you something. You still do sacrifices and not just praise. When you crucify the flesh, that's a sacrifice. When you repent of sin, that's a sacrifice in which the blood of Messiah covers that. For you receive forgiveness and renewal and it pushes the devil out the door. So if everything that I do is either opening doors or closing doors, when I begin to learn how to walk in the ways of God, I am learning by following the ways of God. You know, especially as a new believer, man, I've got to close all these doors. I, I mean, the devil had one big enough he could drive 10 semis side by side into my life with. I'm getting those doors closed. But it's not just that. You have to start opening doors to God through obedience to Jesus. That's actually the way to blessing. Quit going through Christian TV like it's Ronco station. No, folks, if you give here, not over there, but over here, we promise you ten angels. Obedience is better than sacrifice. You can't give your way out of a crisis, but you can repent and change your life and walk out of a crisis with Jesus holding your hand. That's the way it's supposed to happen. And I'm going to have to put a pin... And I don't have one. I know I'm right there. 
And we'll, we'll get into more of this in the next session, but it's time to re- for us to return back to publicity if we're going to be more than overcomers in the last days. We, we need to be aware of what God wants to do and how to walk in kingdom because we're going to have to have kingdom authority. We're going to have to have a sanctified life. Jesus said one time the devil came to him and he says, you have nothing in me. That ought to be our statement every day. The devil comes to tempt us, and we should be able to look at him saying, you have nothing in me, and all you see is the blood. That's a mature believer that's ready to fight. Last thing you want on the field of battle, you know, I'm ex-military, U.S. Army. I had on this soldier, on this soldier, on this, I can say it in tongues, shoulder, U.S. Army patch, okay, American flag. You don't want to see a Russian flag when you're going to go fight the Russians on this shoulder. We've got to be waving the banner of Jesus and lifting his name high as we go into battle. Well, Father, I thank you for your word. Father, I thank you it will not return to you void, but it will accomplish whereunto you have sent it. And Father, let the women awaken to righteousness in this moment. Let us grow up to be that army that can fight for you and win souls to Jesus in the last days, we ask. In Jesus' name. The fallen immortals that rule the kingdom of darkness have enabled the esoteric societies that control this world to nearly fulfill Nimrod's dark directive. They have taken society down the Luciferian rabbit hole into a technological matrix of darkness. But the Almighty will not allow the enemy to bring his demonic forces for the final showdown without raising up one of his own. God is waking up people around the world who are shaking off their techno-sorcery-induced spiritual slumber and are answering heaven's call. There is an end-time empowerment coming for God's remnant, and it is beginning to unfold in our day. It is time to awaken be empowered and become the Sheerith in this generation. The Sheerith Imperative is a must-have tactical manual for God's remnant in the last days. Get your copy at KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. That's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. Hell may have its directive, but heaven has its imperative. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store dot biblical dash life dot com that's store dot biblical dash life dot com